Good day, everyone. My name is Samia Pata. I'm your economics teacher right now, and I'll be solving some questions together, which you may likely come across in your forthcoming exams, like JAM, YEC, NECO, or A level exams. So, as I start to teach right now, I want you to listen attentively and learn one or two things. Thank you so much for following. Question number one If the price of a commodity rises and the quantity demanded, of the commodity remains the same, then the demand for the commodity is A, static, B, infinitely elastic, C, externally determined, D, perfectly inelastic. To get these questions right, you can make use of graph. You can make use of graph. This is quantity demanded, and this is the price. This is the origin, and from the question, if the price of the commodity rises, maybe the price of the commodity rises, this is 5 Naira, this is 10 Naira, this is 15 Naira, this is 20 Naira. And, and quantity demanded of the commodity remains the same. The demand for the commodity. This is the quantity. It remains the same while the prices increase. Now, if you see this kind of diagram, it is perfectly inelastic demand. Perfectly inelastic demand because as the price is changing, you understand? then the quantity demanded remains the same. That can only work perfectly for perfectly inelastic demand. So if you see any diagram like this, it is perfectly inelastic demand. So if there's a change in price, and at the same time the quantity demanded remains on the spot or the same, it is perfectly inelastic demand. The next question. In order to increase its profit margin, the monopolist can manipulate monopoly you know, a monopolist is someone, you know, who is the only person in the market selling goods. You know, is the only seller. And uh, monopolist can either influence the price or the output. If he wants to make more profits, you understand, he can decide to increase the price. And by the time he increases the price, then he will make more money because people will not have choice. Because he's the only one in the market, then they will patronize him more. As a result of that, he makes more money. So, he can either influence the price or the quantity. As a matter of fact, if he increases the price, no matter what, people will still buy. If he tries as much as possible to reduce the quantity, people will still buy his product. So, a monopolist can either increase the price or the output. That is the perfect answer. Question number three. Which of the following is an important function of the retailer? A retailer is actually uh, the, the, the second to the last in the chain of distribution. The second to the last agent in the chain of distribution because the retailer will get products from all sellers. And um, as a matter of fact, they break bulk. They sell different kinds of commodities. When the consumers, when they get to their shops, they buy different things they want to buy and they'll be satisfied through consumption. Now, they are asking which of the following is an important function of the retailer. Grant credit to the wholesaler, breaks bulk and sells products in small units. C, reduces cost of distribution. D, generates demand for production through advertisement. You know, from this option, the retailer breaks bulk and sells products in small units. They break bulk you know, they can buy packets of biscuits. They can buy, you know, sachet water, different bags, different kinds of products. They break it, they get it in their shop, and the consumers, they come to their shop to buy whatever to buy. And some of them may tell them they want to buy biscuits. Some will tell them, I want to buy sachet water. Some will tell them, I want to buy, you know, they have varieties of goods that they can buy. So it's a perfect function of a retailer. A, grant credit to the wholesaler. So the answer is they break bulk and sell products in small units. Question number four. One of the purposes of advertisement in marketing is to A, change the quality of the product. B, raise the quantity of the product demanded as its price falls. C, shift the demand curve for the product to the right. D, raise production costs. One of the purposes of advertisement in marketing. Advertisement is actually one of the factors affecting demand. Advertisement is one of the factors affecting demand. And um, you see, it can either be in favor of a particular product or be against. 
you know, if I want to sell a particular product, I can decide to do publicity. And people will get to know about the product and they will buy. So, advertisements can cause demand curve to shift either to the right or to the left. And when you look at the factors affecting demand, there are factors that can make demand curve to shift, which are other factors affecting demand except price. What do I mean? Different factors affecting demand. We have the price, we have advertisement, we have population, we have uh, price of other commodities and the likes. Other factors affecting demand can cause demand curve to shift either to the left or to the right. And one of the factors that can make demand curve to shift to the right or left is uh, advertisement. So the perfect answer to that question is shift to the demand curve for the product of the, to the right. Because advertisement in favor of a particular product will make more people to buy it. And if more people are buying it, you understand? That means the demand curve will shift. Somebody that was uh, using black and white television before, you know, which is no longer relevant, can decide to buy color television if he knows about it, if he's aware about it, if probably maybe there is a kind of publicity that creates awareness about that particular product. And a lot of people will now shift from buying black and white television to color television. So advertisement can make that happen. That is why C is the perfect answer. Question number five. The term double coincidence of wants is usually associated with A, bilateral exchange mechanism, B, monetary exchange mechanism, C, stock exchange system, D, butter exchange me mechanism. It is butter exchange mechanism because under the butter system, you have a product, I have a product. As a matter of fact, the product you need, you must have a product that I need and I must also have the product you need. That is the meaning of the butter system. So it is called double coincidence of one. So exchange can take place when I see someone who has what I need and I'm able to also give the person what he needs. So the perfect answer to that is butter exchange uh, mechanism, which is the term double coincidence of one. That means you have what I need, then I also have what you need. Then we meet ourselves and we exchange goods for goods. That's pa the perfect example to that is D, butter exchange mechanism. Question number six. A major factor affecting the value of money is the A, price level, B, banking habit, C, transaction motive, D, divisible nature of money. The perfect answer to that is price level. Price level, you see, what, 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 do, they talk, what do they mean by value of money? Value of money simply means what money can buy. And what money can buy can simply be affected by the general price level. The higher the price, the lower the quantity that will be demanded, or the lower the price, the higher the quantity that will be demanded. So, a major factor affecting the value of money is the price level. Question number seven. Cost push inflation is caused by A, growth of government expenditure, B, increase in factor prices, C, increase in money supply, D, order. Cost push inflation is caused by, it is increase in factor prices. If you get some people to work for you, and uh, they decide to increase their money, that okay, they can no longer work for you except to increase their pay. There is no way you, they will increase their pay and you pay them and it won't have a positive effect on how people will buy their products. Because increase in the wages you are paying to them will automatically increase the cost of production. So as a matter of fact, by the time the cost of production is high, then the price of the commodity will be high, which can lead to cost push inflation. So it is caused by increase in factor prices. Factor prices, those things that are involved in producing a particular product. If those things are on the high side, then the product prices will be increased, which can cause cost push inflation. The next question, question number eight. Commercial bank reserves at the central bank have the effect of Commercial bank reserves at the central bank have the effect of A, controlling credit and money supply, B, discouraging banking operations, C, advancing trade prospect, D, reducing bank frauds. The most important factor, the most important effect is controlling credit and money supply. So they can know the, the capacity, you know, the, the, the flow of money and be monitored by central bank. So commercial bank reserves at the central bank have the effect of controlling credit and money supply. The next question. 
Question number nine. A tax is defined as regressive if A, the proportion of income paid as tax increase as the income level increases. No. All income group pay the same percentage of their income as tax. No. The proportion of income taken by the tax falls as income increases. Yes. Then D is not also the option. The proportion of income taken by the tax is fixed. No, 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 no. C is the answer. The proportion. You know, regressive tax, where your income increases, you, your tax will be reduced. That is regressive tax. So, question number 10. Government intervention in an economy is often justified on the group that A, wants are unlimited, while resources are scarce. B, productivity is higher in the public than in the private sector. C, free markets may not work or produce desirable results. D, opportunity cost of government expenditure is zero. The perfect answer to that is once are unlimited, why resources are scarce. You know, some things that people cannot power, do not have capacity to get, government can intervene and get it to work. And government can intervene and make it available. That is why there is need for government intervention. And not because of anything, because our wants are unlimited and also the resources are scarce. Question number 11. Optimal population is the population level at which A. Debt rate is at minimum. B. Per capita income is at maximum. C. Population is at maximum. D. Debt rate is equal to bed rates. Optimal population, in, you know, in a population where we have optimal population, everything will be working because per capita income is at maximum. The disposable income will be minimal. Everything will work out fine. So optimal population is the population level at which per capita income is at maximum. It can't be debt rates is at maximum. No. Under the optimal population, things will work well because the resources will equate the number of people in the society. And it can't be population is at maximum. It can't be debt rate is equal to bed rate. The perfect answer to that is perfect Per capita income is at maximum, not because of anything, but because the resources actually equate the number of population within the society. Question number 12. When elasticity is zero, the demand curve is A, perfectly elastic, B, perfectly inelastic, C, concave, D, downward sloping, E, circular. I have explained this in one of the questions I've solved earlier. When I see zero, the demand curve is perfectly inelastic and that is why i drew this graph you can see it it is perfectly inelastic that means it is the same if some textbook will tell we tell you it is zero elastic demand the price is changing and the quantity demanded remain the same the price changes and the quantity demanded remain the same so it is zero elasticity of demand or perfectly inelastic so from the question when i see zero the demand curve is perfectly inelastic Question number 13. Inferior goods are referred to in economics as goods, inferior goods. Inferior goods are goods that, you know, you buy less when your income increases. That simply, you know, tells you about inferior goods. When you have more money, you decide to buy less of it. That is inferior goods. So now, they now said inferior goods are referred to in economics as goods whose quality is low. We know that the quality is low. But let's check other options. Consumed by very poor people. Well, it is consumed by very poor people. It may, it may not. C, whose consumption falls? When consumers' income rises, I think that is more perfect. The D, which satisfies only the basic needs. No, none of the above. Whose consumption falls? When consumers' income rises. The consumption of it falls as your income rises. That is inferior goods. So when you buy less of it, when your income increases, then you can term it inferior good. So the perfect answer to that is C. The next question, question number 14. The law of comparative advantage states that a country should specialize in the production of a commodity. A country should specialize in the production of commodity A, for which local demand is greatest. No, it can't be that. B, in which its opportunity cost is lower than that of the trade partner. It's, that one looks like it, but let's check other options. For which foreign demand is greatest? No. If it's as for more foreign demand, that means they don't need it in that particular country. It can't be that answer. Then for which there is a bonus supply of raw materials? No. 
then it which is opportunity cost is lower than that of the trade partner that means if they are not producing that thing they can utilize their resources the resources they have to produce other things that will be more available and they will be able to export it to other countries so if they now feel that other countries can produce that stuffs and they can actually get it cheaper rather than producing it in that country and i think it's wise to be able to do that and in which its opportunity cost is lower than that of the trade partner is a perfect option so the answer to that is b question number 15. a sustained increase in the per capita income of a country over a period of time is called economic development if the per capita income of uh, people within the society is actually increased you know more sustained if it is sustained if it is a sustenance increment a sustained increase in per capita income of a country over a period of time is called a economic growth b economic development c structural change d stagflation the perfect answer to that is economic development economic growth simply means you know when something is just large the, it may not really affect the per capita of an individual within the society but when it is economic development it is all encompassing everything is working perfectly as a matter of fact it can also affect the per capita income of the of the particular country so the perfect answer to that is economic development economic growth simply means just it will just be the physical growth you understand it will not be the the main development that we need in a society question number 16 if one orange costs 20 kobo and one kilogram of beef costs 10 era the opportunity cost of one kilogram of beef is i said it in one of our one of the teachings one of the lessons we we actually did some times ago the opportunity cost simply means what you left on board what you left on board for example if i want to buy uh bonvita and milo and they said bonvita is 2,500. Milo is 2,500. And I was having, and I'm having 2,500 Naira on me. If I decide to buy Milo instead of Bovita, the Bovita I did not buy is my opportunity cost. And that is why we also refer opportunity cost as alternative for guns. So now look at this question. If orange costs 20 cover and one kilogram of beef costs 10 Naira, the opportunity cost of the one kilogram of beef, that means if you are not buying the beef, automatically you will buy oranges because the orange you did not buy is what is called opportunity cost the beef they said it cost how much it cost 10 era opportunity cost of one kilogram of beef is that means if you did not buy the beef then you bought the oranges and orange cost 20 cover all you have to do is just to think about it that what can you use there how many oranges can you buy with 10 era and if you do a calculation very well you will discover that you can buy 50 oranges with 10 error. If you do the calculation, you can do it on your own. You get 50 oranges by, by paying 10 error. If you pay 10 error to buy oranges, you can buy 50 oranges with 10 error if the orange costs 20 kobo per one. So the opportunity cost of one kilogram of beef is 50 oranges. The next question, question number 17. In economic life, choice among alternatives depends on the in economic life, choice among alternatives depends on the A, income of the decision maker, B, scarcity of resources, C, scale of preference of the decision maker, D, status of the decision maker. The perfect answer to that is scale of preference of the decision maker. What is scale of preference? Scale of preference is just arrangement of your wants or needs in order of importance. And the reason why scale of preference you know, is being used or is being, is being leveraged on is because of the resources that are scarce. We have limited resources. That is why you have to write all your wants according to how important they are. And note that your number one item on your scale of reference is the most important. It is the most important. Your number one on your list of scale of reference is the most important. So now, they now said choice among alternatives because you have different alternatives. And as an economist, you need to write everything down. So, you can decide to go for number one, you can decide to go for number two, you can decide to go for number three. But the most important is number one. So, when you write your wants down and you try to go for one, is when you pick one out of different alternatives, it is scale of preference in action. So, in economic life, choice among alternatives 
depends on the scale of reference of the decision maker. Then, question number 18. One of the major advantages of specialization is that specialization, you know, where you do something regularly, you are specialized in that, you know, if it is cutting the clothes, that may be your own field. Someone may be in charge of cutting, another person may be in charge of sewing, another person may be in charge of, you know, different segments. So, when you talk about specialization, it brings speed. Because it is what you have been doing over and over, over and over. So, you know what to do part time. So, when you check the option, one of the major advantages of failure is that A, the worker becomes a tender of machines. B, it causes more employment of labor. C, less material is required for production. D, the worker wastes less time between operations because he's already used to that work. So, it makes the work faster. Question number 19. Which of the following rewards, which of the following rewards is associated with entrepreneurship as a factor of production? In economics, you know, there are factors of production. We have land, we have labor, we have capital and entrepreneur. And they all have their rewards. So, salaries and wages, you know, belongs to the labor part. You know, profits. Profit is to the entrepreneur because you are doing a business, not because of anything, simply to make profit. Then interest, interest on the capital and rent on the land you are using for production. So, which of the following rewards are say entrepreneurship? So, entrepreneurship, we always want to make profit. So, the perfect answer to question number 19 is profit. The next question. No, question number 20. The law of diminishing marginal utility indicates that if a consumer increases its consumption of a commodity continuously, the law of diminishing marginal utility indicates that if a consumer increases its consumption of a commodity continuously, is a Total utility must fall. B, marginal utility must fall. C, marginal utility may rise even though its total utility is falling. D, marginal utility may fall even though its total. This can be explained, you know, in diagram. This can be explained with diagram and uh, this is total utility. And this is an MU. This is MU, and this is the utils, and this is the quantity. So, now, what is utility? Utility is actually the power of good to give satisfaction. Probably, maybe the weather is hot, and you decide to buy an ice cream. The first bowl of ice cream you take, you will enjoy it more, you know, followed by the second one, followed by the third bowl. But at the end of the day, by the time you are getting to the fourth or the fifth bowl, you'll be tired. So, as you are consuming more products or more commodity, the marginal utility will tend to decrease. That is why the graph is like this. And you must note that when the quantity you are consuming is increasing, the marginal utility will be dropping. And it will get to a point where it will be zero. And before you know what happens, it will tend to negative. But mind you, the total utility will be increasing it gets to a point where it gets to the peak and it starts to come down. That is total utility. So, marginal utility will decrease as you consume more products because the enjoyment will be diminishing. The enjoyment will be coming down as you are consuming more products. So, the answer to that, the law of diminishing marginal utility in the case that if a consumer increases his consumption or commodity continuously, his total utility must fall, marginal utility must fall. The marginal utility must fall. And that is why we can see it in this diagram, marginal utility. So that is it. The answer to that is B.